Morning, Glory America. Time to introduce Continenti the God. Matt Continenti is senior uh, head of domestic policy studies. He's laughing, but he, I heard the commentary podcast yesterday, and I've just got to call him Continenti the God now. Uh, he is also a commentary podcast contributor, a commentary columnist, a Washington Free Beacon columnist, author of the book The Right and Intellectual History of the Right in America, and a generally good guy. Uh, Continenti the God, did you listen to Charlemagne the God host Kamala Harris yesterday? I listened to a few uh, clips to you, and of course, I think the main story coming out of the interview is Harris's suggestion that she is ready and willing to study uh, reparations for slavery. And I expect the Trump campaign to amplify her comments uh, on, on that subject uh, through Election Day. The, the uh, Kreskin, otherwise known as Abe Greenwald, who was right that interviews are her kryptonite, she did it again. She got near an interview and she said reparations, that's fine. But generally the most important part was the caller, Bobby, who I want to play for you right now, because Bobby called the Breakfast Club yesterday, and here's what he said, cut number 16. Hi, I'm Bobby from Georgia, and I have a question for Kamala Harris. Could you please respond to Trump's claim that he's going to use the Alien Enemies Act of 1798 to round up immigrants if he wins the election? This law was last used to put Asian Americans in internment camps during World War II, and I have a sneaking suspicion that if Trump wins, he's going to use this law to put anyone that doesn't look white in camps, and I'm scared. Mm. Yeah, so uh, you've hit on a really important point and expressed it, I think, so well, which is he is achieving his intended effect to make you scared. All right, uh, Matt, Bobby from Georgia is nuts. So what ought Kamala Harris to have said to Bobby from Georgia when he suggested that non-white people are going into camps under some law that was actually not used during Korematsu, and Korematsu, which has been repealed by the Supreme Court and explicitly denounced for being bad law at the time, what ought she to have said? Well, she ought to have said that there's no evidence that Trump is going to do that. And uh, she also could have said that it's time to take a step back and lower the temperature as we approach Election Day, now less than three weeks away, Hugh. You know, Bobby's suspicion uh, is widespread. And you look at some of the comments coming out of uh, liberals uh, in, in these final weeks of the election, and it's, they're terrifying what they're saying. James Carville, the Democratic strategist, actually said that Donald Trump has booked Madison Square Garden for an end of election rally uh, in uh, homage or in a historical echo of the Nazi Bund rally there in 1939. Uh, that's it's insanity. I mean, we all know why Trump wants Madison Square Garden. It's a huge venue. He's from New York and Trump has been obsessed for 10 years with winning New York State in the election. I mean, the, the type of paranoia you're beginning to see on the left is really striking, and I think it's uh, several levels more um, deranged than even the first go-round with Trump derangement syndrome in 2016. We now also have Elon Musk derangement syndrome. I began the show by playing audio of the California Coastal Commission, where they said the quiet part out loud. They won't permit SpaceX launches from Vandenberg because they don't like Elon Musk's politics, and they said it again and again and again. That's so unconstitutional, I can't even begin to tell you. Uh, Charles C.W. Cook would know that. You would know that. But you know 42 U.S.C. 8, uh, 1983 exists to punish people who, under color of state law, infringe civil rights. They did that, but it was like a merry-go-round of constitutional wrongs. Do you think this is a mind virus that is spreading? Well, in Elon Musk's case, Hugh, it's worse than a mind, uh, mind virus. It's an actual concerted effort, I think, on the part of the federal government to target Musk and his companies. I think almost every single one of Musk's companies is now under some sort of federal regulation uh, or investigation or action. The exception might be the boring company, the one that, that, that does the tunnels. And when you con contrast that behavior on part of our government with what Musk continues to do in the realm of engineering, 
I mean, it's just staggering. It's a, the idea that here's Elon Musk who was able to have a rocket land and, and be caught by these robot arms in what's called the chopsticks maneuver. Some of the most incredible images and accomplishments of, in the history of humankind. And then I read the next day in the New York Times describing Musk on the stump with Trump and the New York Times calls Musk a frenzied billionaire. I think he's a whole lot more than that. And I think many American voters, especially male voters, really like Elon Musk and uh, listen to him in all areas, including politics. He's a genius. No, he's not my kind of genius. I almost flunked high school physics, but he's a genius. And here's what I would do. I wouldn't put him in charge of government efficiency. I'd put him in charge of DARPA. And I'd say, go find things that can blow up anything, anywhere, at any time and tell our enemies about it. Matt, I got to switch over to Israel because uh, commentary is where I go to hear a serious conversation about American Israeli politics. Headline number one, White House says no hostage talks taking place blame Sinwar. Good. Israel said to decide on targets it could strike in Iran in a matter of time. Now a matter of time. Good. Israel saw, said demining uh, de along Golan frontier, signaling operation against Hezbollah could widen. Good. IDF strikes Beirut for first time in days amid U.S. concerns over bombing campaign. Good. 11 soldiers have died. IDF soldiers have died in Lebanon. And Lebanon, Hezbollah launched a lethal attack by drone against an Israeli Air Force base over the weekend. Here's the bad news. U.S. gives Israel 30 days to address Gaza aid crisis, threatens to curb weapons supply. What do you think of that last story, Matt Continetti? Well, I don't think much of it, Hugh. I, I'm outraged at this story. I think it's another example of politics dictating policy. Let's not forget that Kamala Harris has not led in a poll in the state of Michigan this month, the month of October. And Democrats are very worried about Michigan, along with the other two Rust Belt states. And it seems clear to me that Harris and the Democrats' response to this concern has been to pressure Israel in an attempt to win over Arab American and Muslim voters in Michigan. And so I see politics behind this demand on the part of the US government. I think it's a foolish policy. I think it's gonna to lead to perverse outcomes. We've seen again and again that whenever this administration pressures Israel, Hamas is emboldened. And let's not forget, Hamas is still in the Gaza Strip. Hamas is the group that will steal whatever food aid goes into, into the Gaza Strip. And by the way, the Gazans are eating. <laughs> they're, they're having, the humanitarian aid it continues to go into the Gaza Strip. And so we see yet again this administration falling for a uh, Hamas disinformation play, uh, playing into the hands of this terrorist group. Also, this administration protecting the Iranian nuclear program, protecting the Iranian regime, which depends on those oil assets, which now, thanks to American pressure, Israel says it won't target in its reprisal against this unprovoked act of aggression from Iran, the second ballistic missile attack from Iran on Israel in the past six months. Uh, this administration's legacy in the Middle East is shameful, in my view. Matt, I'm not sure that Israel has agreed to that. It's been leaked by American officials that they've agreed, but I don't believe anything that American officials say Netanyahu or Gallant have said. I just don't believe them. I think they try and maneuver Israel into rhetorical corners by doing that. Now, here's the question. Former President Trump was my guest 10 days ago. I asked him, and I hope Brett will ask Kamala, but Brett is a professional. He'll come up with his own question set. Does Israel have the right to retaliate against Iran? I said, I hope so. They have a free shot, right? And, you know, that's the kind of candor I love. Yes, absolutely. Do you think Brett will ask, and what will Kamala say about attacking Iran? I think Brett will ask a question like that, Hugh. I think Harris will probably respond by saying that she grew up in a middle-class family. That's her <laughs> first sentence to any question she's asked. Once she gets past the fact that she grew up in a middle class home, she'll give some boilerplate answer saying that she doesn't think escalation is the uh, way to resolve what's happening in the Middle East. And then she'll pivot and she'll talk about the need for a ceasefire in Gaza in order to release the hostages. It seems to me that Kamala Harris's talking points on the Middle East are weeks behind the actual flow of events there in the region. 
And e as you said, while you were reading those headlines, Hugh, uh, government officials acknowledge that there's no hostage deal to be had with Hamas at this point. Yahya Sinwar, the leader of Hamas, will hold on to those hostages. The hostages will have to be rescued. They're not going to come home based on a negotiation. Yet that's not reflected in Harris's rhetoric. It's not reflected in Tim Walz's rhetoric. And I expect that Brett will politely push back if that's the answer he receives. And this is why the special report interview is so important. Harris has really encountered only one interviewer, uh, Bill Whitaker of 60 Minutes, who really kind of questioned and kind of dug in and kind of said, okay, well, what what's the second order, third order question uh, based on your response, Madam Vice President? Um, now, uh, Harris will have to face that with Brett Baer. He's a trusted anchor, trusted reporter. And I think a lot of people are going to be watching to see how Harris uh, deals with Brett's questions. I, I give her some credit for showing up. I, I will I will say that. Um, this Biden hasn't done it while, he, while he's been president. This is the first time Harris has done it since she's been vice president. But uh, this is going to be, I think, a highly scrutinized event. Um, and we'll see if it makes any any big difference. However, based on her record in interviews so far, I think there's a lot of peril uh, for her to, to sit down for this meeting today. I talked to Trump for 27 minutes. Brett gets Harris for 30. I had 14 questions. How many questions do you think he'll get in with the filibuster, or the vice filibuster in chief? Because she's not as good as Obama. Yeah, maybe half, half that. Uh, I think he'll he'll order them uh, well, though. I think he'll have a sense of what he wants to talk about. Um, and what we've seen from Harris, though, is uh, she's not going to want to get into details. Um, in fact, at that town hall with Charlemagne and, and the Breakfast Club uh, yesterday, she was asked, well, what do you say to people who accuse you of only sticking with talking points? And Harris said, I say you're welcome as though that's a great achievement, you know, to only be on the talking points. I don't think she'll have the same situation when she sits down with Brett Baer. Stick around. I'm going to ask Matt for his understanding of the race during the break. We'll put it on the podcast, and, of course, we'll put it over at YouTube on my channel almost immediately so you can see what Continetti thinks is going on. Continetti the God, by the way. He, he, he laid down his terms yesterday, and I am respectful of my guests. Stay tuned. Welcome back, America. I'm with Continenti the God. Matt, I'm Irish, so I always assume there will be a bad ending. Uh, I, I always assume that it's going to go wrong and sideways at the end. That's our way. What do you think of the state of the election right now, and if it were held today, who would win? If the election were held today, Hugh, uh, I think we'd have a 50-50 race, and I, I think Harris has a slight edge in the Rust Belt states. Uh, I mean, and when I say slight, I mean under 1%. I mean, potentially hundreds of votes separating the winner and loser in those critical states of uh, Wisconsin, Michigan, and Pennsylvania. Um, and so uh, I think it's, she still has a slight advantage in this election, but it's extremely slight and Trump is closing. And we've known in the past that Trump closes very well in 16 and in 20. So even though I say that, for the election today, um, I see Trump having momentum in these last in these last weeks. Do you know what my nightmare scenario is, Matt? Is that we have, by whatever hook or crook, essentially an election that comes down to North Carolina, and to the votes of the mountain regions impacted by Helene, that we cannot get to, and we cannot find out if they voted, and we can't find their votes. It's it's worse than Florida 2000, because at least in Florida 2000, you could drive from polling place to polling place, and you could watch the hanging chads being counted. If it's up in the mountains where we're doing our fundraising drive for food for the poor because they're just shattered, that would be a nightmare for the country. Agree? Oh, yeah, I absolutely agree. I would say that uh, there is a chance, though, that that scenario won't happen, Hugh, simply because in recent days— Trump's um, lead in North Carolina, I think, has uh, solidified in some of the polling I'm seeing. Trump's doing very well right now in the in the Sun Belt states, North Carolina, Georgia, Arizona. Uh, the real question is, is he going to be able to 
get over the finish line ahead of Harris in the Rust Belt, Wisconsin, Michigan, Pennsylvania. Right now, Michigan is looking the best of the three. Pennsylvania, of course, has been tied for weeks. And you expect that a tie like that in a state like Pennsylvania, maybe you give a slight edge to Trump. Uh, so as I say, um, it's extremely tight. I think that Trump may have a little bit of an advantage in the final weeks. And I think w if the nightmare scenarios come, I, I agree that North Carolina is scary, uh, but I see something in Pennsylvania um, as kind of more likely simply because Pennsylvania has not fixed its vote count issues. And this is a and Matt, one, one last comment, one last question. I grew up seven sure. miles from Sharon, Pennsylvania. I know Western Pennsylvania. We would play Western Pennsylvania football teams at John F. Kennedy High School. We would go back and forth. To, I know Western Pennsylvania. I, I don't know Philly. Uh, it's a big state, but I'm feeling pretty good about it. Here's my last question, uh, and I need a spontaneous uh, response from you. I think Harris and Walls is the worst ticket ever nominated by a major party in my lifetime, including McGovern Eagleton. What do you think? Uh, in, well, my lifetime's shorter than yours, Hugh, but yeah, I think that only means by about that half. It's more likely that's more likely to be the case that this is the worst ticket. Absolutely, combined when you think of lack of experience, lack of knowledge, lack of fluency in the issue. The, when you have the vice president who literally says, "I'm a knucklehead," every time he, he's challenged on his habitual lying and deceit. Uh, yeah, I'd say it's it's pretty pretty bad ticket. Any ticket that says we're the knucklehead ticket, I, I don't know uh, how uh, people can um, rationalize uh, wanting to put them in charge of this nation's very pressing and urgent public crises. Amen, Matt. Please get over to commentary, get that recorded and propagated earlier. It came out too late yesterday. I was close to the end of my trundling.